Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode... We can give this one a number, 229, buddy. We can. It's a special episode. For a lot of reasons. Yes. For very many reasons. Um, name the, four. Name four. <laughs> oh, it's a quiz? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we're gonna, it's a themed episode. We're going to talk about Robin Williams okay. movies. We're going to celebrate his career. Um, it's with an intern who's not who's we've never had on the show. Okay, great. Two. It's um, we have a Kickstarter backer ad. <laughs> Three. <laughs> okay. And um, this episode is dropping while I am in China. All right, done. Four. Suck it, man. Yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um. Didn't know I was going to be challenged out yeah. of the gate. Uh, <laughs> um, Got to keep you on your toes. I know. Holy shit. Um, well, this is uh, this is really exciting. And one of the things, too, I want to have Aaron on. Um, well, let's introduce Let's him introduce first. him. Couldn't hurt. Yeah. Couldn't- <laughs> <laughs> this is um, um, one of the interns, also one of the interns for ATC, for mm-hmm. All Things Comedy, and also a big comedy fan. Can tell you pretty much anything you want to know about a um, lot of comedians working today, and all ones you know in the past too. He's just a comedy fan, and that's also one of the reasons why we wanted to have him on this uh, well, show today to have a fan's perspective. Fan's as well. perspective, which mm-hmm. we've we've done a couple, one or two of these intern shows. We've had Ben on, we've had Keith. Mm-hmm. Who else? We had anyone else? Uh, ben, Keith. Uh, no, I think that's it. We never had Sharon on when she was. No, uh, we even, I don't even think we had the podcast. Well, she no, was. Sharon was uh, our first intern. Just worked on the website, right? Yeah. Before we had anything else. Mm-hmm. Poor bastard. I know. Mm-hmm. And Dan, we had Dan on, right? When he remember when he was. Oh well, yeah. Dan would uh, he would chime in too. Same with Sean. Okay, yeah. so if you're playing along at home, I'm the last one to come on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a few. You guys more. went to Japan and interviewed Sanai before yeah. me. <laughs> I live a mile and a half away. Yeah. Yeah, well, you need to live in a more exotic location. That's yeah. true. That's true. So Mel- here he is. Is Aaron Brunghart. Prung- Did I say it right? Brungart. 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 Okay. Really exercise the G. Brungart. Yeah. Now, okay. technically not true because we interviewed you for the film. That's true. For uh, Sinai. That's right. You came by mm-hmm. the improv. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's when uh, Aaron said something very um, surprising to me. He said it would be a dream to be on the Comedy Film Nerds podcast. We had no idea. Most people are scared yeah, to yeah. be on it. I don't know. And What's up with them? What's yeah. <laughs> I've got a sword. I can hack it here. Look, let's go. <laughs> so what first? when did you first start listening to the show? What turned you on to Comedy Film Nerds? I think uh, early on, you know, I was into WTF was probably the gateway. And oddly enough, the Robin Williams episode was the one I was told, you have to listen to this. Uh-huh. And then I went back and devoured the catalog to that point, right. which was still all available. Um, and then it was just like, okay, podcasts are great. I'm all cut up on WTF. Uh what else can I find? And it was like, I just like typed in Doug Benson because I already knew Doug loves movies and he was, you know, one of your first mm-hmm. guests. So that's how I was led to be a comedy film nerd. Cool. Get my, that's how I got my kitten hands. <laughs> nice. <laughs> now, it, it was funny though when he walked in that we, he, we were like, you'd never been in here. He goes, you went, no. And you went, wow, there's the weight bench. Yeah, there's, there's the, the gargoyles. gargoyles. <laughs> there's the merch. <laughs> there's the and, actual kitten hands. And you see Dean Hagelin's, uh, painting of us yeah that Hunch is Hunt amazing first. yeah <laughs> there's our original microphone the snowball yeah, blue behind when we you first started uh recording the episode on so now aaron before we get started um when did you first start following and listening to comedians because this seems like it's um is like a lifelong thing i i would say it is i mean more so watching the specials and i think for people my age i'm 31 and i think it was around 2000 um, or 1999 when so many of your peers started having their specials, their half hours mm-hmm. or hours um, on Comedy Central and just constantly on repeat. Um, so, you know, I was 16 or whatever right. at that time, just at home watching TV. So, I mean, it's it's hard to avoid it at a certain point. Especially when it's kind of the only thing on all day. Right. There's incredible Hulk reruns. <laughs> I'm well versed in Quantum Leap and uh, <laughs> and comedy specials from 2000 on. Nice. Yeah. Um, I even watched uh, strip poker. Grandma wow. hosted game show on USA. Right. That's a- I've helped shape so many young boys' lives uh, <laughs> on strip poker. It was great that I was able to participate in any of your whack off fantasies. <laughs> at least facilitate them. Hopefully, I wasn't in yes. them, but no. uh, at least the. And I, you know, facilitated the um, 
<laughs> the maturing of middle-aged women when I was writing for Port Charles. <laughs> 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 it's the Lord's work, yeah. what we do here in show business town. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you enjoyed strip poker. Any fa- favorite stri- the strip poker episodes that stand out? I think the one with girls in it. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, right, one. where they got yeah. in bikinis. Uh-huh. And, yeah, yeah, I made fun of them and the boys. Right, mm-hmm. it's good stuff. That was 195. A loud up- shirt. <laughs> a loud. Picked up by a stylist. Yes, I had a bowling shirt with fire on it, or dice, or dice and fire, or a martini glass with fire and dice. Well, that was the promo picture. <laughs> it was. That's what we had. You know what I think I should include? I should bring over here. I think I still have some strip poker promo photos. Oh, oh yeah, you know, definitely. Color ones. Oh, I'm going to bring those over. Yeah. I might even have a cram one, too, but I'll bring over the strip poker ones. Cause those bring them to the festival. That's a fan giveaway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring those to the festival. Come to the Comedy Film Nerds Live at the Podfest. And that's we'll, a good giveaway. That's a great giveaway. I forgot I had that shit. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> You're welcome. For reminding me. Thank you. <laughs> Reminded me of the glories of cable television. <laughs> so, well, let's talk about our ad, our uh, Kickstarter. This backer. is a very special one. This is this is really special. This is, uh, you know, it's not only a promotion but a message. It's a message, very, very yeah. important message. And Usually, it's like someone's personal business that they want to promote on the Kickstarter. This mm-hmm. one's a little different. It's very passionate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is Brian Shanovich, and um, what do you want the ad to say? And this is what he typed in. Eat healthy foods. Now, that's great advice. Right, good advice. Right? I think that's a, good, that's a good ad. Yeah. Buy from your local farmer's markets. Again, great, great advice. I love that. Support local farmers. Yes. Like we talk about that in this show. Mm-hmm. Vote with your dollar. Yeah. Support your local farmer. And screw Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he typed. He typed those three sentences. That was worth $350. <laughs> yes. God bless you. Thank you for supporting Brian. Earbuds, the podcasting documentary. <laughs> And going on a diatribe of into Whole Foods. Yes. You know, take it to those corporate bitches. <laughs> <laughs> One podcast at a time. Right. Take them it, down. This is yeah. the way to do it. Um, <laughs> so anybody has a manifesto, uh, send it to us and we'll read it. Well, it costs you $350. <laughs> it does. Read your How manifesto. How else are you going to get your manifesto uh, on you know the air? I mean? Imagine Seriously. if the Unabomber had podcasting yeah. back in the day. CNN charges more. I know. Yeah. You know, we're cheaper. And they're dicks. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta have a gun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this show's all about. Um, it's kind of hard to transition off of that. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Should we just wrap up the episode? Yeah, just, just <laughs> like, all right. See you next week, everybody. I did it, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Finally, congratulations, Aaron. This is your dream come true, buddy. Um, and this is what Robin Williams would have is, wanted. Yeah, just fucking up a show and bailing. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's let's talk about this. Obviously, this has been unbelievably tragic for um, everyone, um, even more so in the comedy community. Because I, I will say this too. You know, comedians have passed away before, comedians that I've known personally. And I've never met Robin Williams, but a lot of comedians on Facebook that I'm friends with have pictures of them with him. And I've never seen so many pictures with any other single celebrity or famous comedian before that everyone had, which is a testament to Robin Williams on how accessible and how much he loved just stand-up comedy, no matter how famous or big he got, it was still a love of his. I, I think, you know, and, a, and part of that comes from, um, you know, that the Throck, Throckmorton Theater, I believe, in Mill Valley, that, that, yeah. that gig mm-hmm. that Mark Pitta books. And I did it once. You know, I worked with, I met Mark, or wor- I worked with him somewhere, Vegas or something like that. And he's like, yeah, come do this. And it's, it's like a Tuesday night. Right. It's this awesome theater in this really cool town. And, you know, in the green room is Mort Saul and Robin Williams yeah, wow, just hanging amazing. out because they like, you know, they like talking about comedy and, and you know. And they were huge fans of strip poker. They loved strip poker. <laughs> they both had loud bowling shirts and leopard skin <laughs> shoes, um, which I had on that show. Uh, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was really, I was like, wow, there's Robin Williams. And. You know, I believe it was the Mark Marin episode where he talked about because you know he had a reputation of taking material, yeah. and a lot of comics were like, Ugh, they didn't, they yeah, they didn't want to perform with him or they didn't want yeah. to perform with him around. And he said that theater was where he felt sort of safe, and and I think too, as some time had passed, I think comics were a little more open to like having him around, and then his body of work as a, as an actor. 
that's what you know it became greater and it greater. became greater and greater and i think that was one of the things at least for me and you know we talked about it a little bit when he first passed away a couple of weeks ago there's no other comic that transcended from club act to actor some of them have gotten famous maybe as much fame as he've had like billy crystal or whatever but billy crystal is not known as this amazing actor that can play all these even whoopi goldberg his two contemporaries you know they both whoopi and billy have you know done some some good movies some yeah. not or whatever but whoopi's got an oscar yeah whoopi's got an oscar and and they're but robin williams and we're going to go through that today the all of the different parts that he played and how he was an a- he was an actor he wasn't a comedian that became a film star right he was yeah. an actor and and i think that that's to me at least was cuz cuz i would you know when i remember when i first moved to la and had been a comic for a while and started taking acting classes at um playhouse west and and you know it was kind it, there wasn't a lot of stand up comics taking serious acting classes but he was the guy that was always referenced yeah like oh you're trying to be like a robin williams or get have robin williams career or whatever um uh yeah yeah fuck i mean it's yeah. the best ever it, it's his career is goddamn amazing <laughs> if you think about it what he accomplished because he didn't just like jump over from a sitcom and then play mork yeah for 15 years right you know and just keep like we've talked about a new there's numerous comedic actors we've talked about on the show that we're, we we get frustrated when they just do the same thing over and over i mean he definitely had those movies that weren't good like club paradise where clearly it was just like just let robin go yeah. you know just there was turn a the camera on he had that tom hanks phase where just kind of took anything sure yeah and you see also there's a lot of cameos well, i but, think the uh, 80s just had I mean, Club Paradise and Summer Rental and yeah. just all don't those forget movies toys. That people had. Toys was awful. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, and uh, but you look at I look but at him young too. Robin Wright Penn. Yeah, <laughs> Robin Wright at the time. Uh, the um, I remember as a kid watching Robin Williams in Happy Days, and you know people don't even realize sometimes that Mork and Mindy was a spinoff yeah, from right. Happy Days. That's where he actually started. And originally, I remember the episode that he was in. Um, no one was thinking spinoff at the no, time. And no. then when they reran that episode, they added a tag at the end. And it was him talking back to the mothership where it was um, Orson saying, I don't want to go to, you know, Boulder. Why do I want to, why do I have to go to Boulder? Right. And then they had that tag <laughs> to set up the spinoff mm-hmm. that he was actually going to, which I thought was, was really cool. Even as a kid, I thought, oh, this is so cool. And... Mm-hmm. I, I think I want to make episode title by the way was Fonzie jumps an alien on his yeah <laughs> was that after the shark was the alien was Mark after Fonzie the shark or was it before I can't remember um, the the happy days order but I I want to make a comparison too with Robin Williams just his uh, his film career it, it's really similar to what Johnny Depp did in the early days because you look at the roles that he played it was a lot of outcasts. And um, characters that weren't were like on the fringe of society for one reason or another, and that's a lot of the things what Johnny Depp did, but in a more extreme way. So you look at this kind of build of a career, and it's absolutely fascinating. He was he always seemed comfortable in those roles, everything from like the genie to like the Fisher King to Goodwill Hunting. There was always something like um, that didn't fit in about that character, some haunted past. Some something that and it was always fascinating to watch. I, I think that's. I, I mean, I think most comedians feel that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I agree. Yeah, you, you feel that's why you grab. I'm it. never really going to fit in I'm nev- anywhere. I'm never going to yeah. fit in anywhere. I'm always sort of the because even when you are on stage, you're the outcast. Yeah, you're the one. You're the one guy in the room doing this. Now, sure, it's if you're if the show's going well, people like you, whatever. Even if you have fans and they buy tickets it's still they're still coming to watch the freak right you know like anybody and oh he's so brave and he talks about all this personal stuff it's like oh jesus like that's success is you know look at my madness or my insanity or my insecurities or my fears or whatever and 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 uh, he translated that in a lot so let's kind of go 
I didn't realize this till I'm looking at IMDb right now in sort of timeline. I always thought World According to Garp was the first one that popped out. It was wrong. Popeye. Yeah, Popeye is the yes, first. Yes, Popeye was the big one. Came out in 1980. And yeah. I remember as a kid, and I watch it just because, oh, Mork is doing Popeye. Bang, doing Popeye. And Robert Altman um, directed it. We were corrected on. Yes. <laughs> we said John Huston. We got corrected immediately. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those films where you know, I, I don't. First of all, it was a musical, right? Yeah, and it's um, it had a twenty million dollar budget, which back then that was a lot of yeah. money. and, and it, fifteen of that went to cocaine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that was back in the coke years. <laughs> and you also, I, I just watched this movie again recently. I watched and, it yesterday, and uh, really? <laughs> like literally, I watched, up. Yeah. yeah, I watched it a couple days ago too, uh, with the because they had never seen it and. You realize that Robin Williams is pretty much a character come uh, like a cartoon come to life. Like he plays Popeye the way if a cartoon character was real, that's what it would be. It's not right. just the giant forearms; it's the way he moved, the way he talked, and everything. He just kind of lost himself in this, you know, weird um, cartoony role. And now, you know, my kids have never seen the Popeye cartoons. It's uh, they liked the movie, but. When you're watching this movie, it's not a great movie, by the way. No. It's, it is not. You can't it's watch this movie. Like, oh, this is hard. a classic. No, it's, yeah. it's tough to get through. Um, but in a, in a weird way, it's also you can't stop watching it because of, you know, even Shelley Duvall playing Olive Oil. Like, oh, my God, she's actually good in a role. You know, this almost <laughs> makes you forget about her almost ruining The Shining. Yeah. Uh, she's actually well cast here. Oh, you here. didn't like The Shining? You didn't like her in The Shining? Oh, my Shining. God. She almost ruined that movie. She's awful in The Shining. <laughs> well, to be she's, fair, she... Stanley Kubrick was slapping her between takes. So. <laughs> yeah. It'd be pretty hard to act. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'd be hard to do that if yeah. was, <laughs> Stanley Kubrick was abusing me. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure that was happening to, uh, you know, uh, what was... Um, the kid, the Scatman Crothers. Yes, so. yeah, <laughs> Scatman Crothers. So, Hong Kong, <laughs> stop it. So you know he pulled it off. So, <laughs> <laughs> so was that true that uh, he was actually? Oh, I believe he, in some sh- some shots. That's what happened. No yeah. way! Wow, yeah. See, I, didn't, I thought you were kidding. No, no I. Oh no, my god! Can't be, she, that's why I'm saying you got to cut her some slack because she she was. Well, yeah, I didn't realize there was physical abuse on he's the set by a lunatic. Yeah, <laughs> who wants? <laughs> A hundred takes of every shot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Didn't Robert Duvall kind of stomp on the set and take care of things? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's what happened. I hope he not Jesus. comes in, threatens him about it with a horse yeah. head or something. Yeah. yeah come on. <laughs> well, think, my know. Kraut Mick friend. <laughs> um, all right. So let's then the 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 breakout role for him then was World According to Garp. Yeah. Which is still one of those movies. I mean, it's based on uh, a novel. Um, it it came out in 1982. It was directed by George Roy Hill. The John Irving wrote the novel, and it was one of those movies where I, it was. It, I, I, as a kid, I watched that movie as a kid, and it's and it struck me. Again, he's this quirky dude who's on the outside. You know what I mean? The way he was conceived was weird. And, and, and well, that, I mean, that book is absolutely insane. Too, right. If you ever read the entire, if you read, read any John Irving novel, right. you realize that, Oh, okay. This, this is, um, this is written by someone who brain process thinks completely differently than anyone else. <laughs> uh, so I, I think this is one of the first movies too, that showed, I mean, Popeye, he was playing a cartoon character. Sure. Yeah. You know, you see the potential of acting in a certain genre. Like, okay, he's going to be great in comedy movies. He's a physical actor, right. blah, blah, blah. He's you, able to keep one eye closed. He's close able to keep one eye closed for yeah. two hours. Uh, <laughs> you don't see any of that potential that would lead you to think, oh, he's going to be great in Garp. Yeah. You don't see it there. Mm-hmm. And when Garp came on the scene, uh, when it was released, you realize, oh, my God, there's so much more to him than just kind of, you know, this manic comedian. Um, that could lose himself in a cartoon role. This is an actual role. And it also required not just drama, but comedy at the same time. Another good example of that is Good Morning Vietnam. When you look at Good Morning Vietnam, it's like not only do you need the strong comedy skills, especially when he's on the radio, but then also the drama when he's not on the radio. In the war zone. In the war zone. Well, let me ask you this, Aaron. So since you weren't, 
you know, like watching these movies when they came out, when did you get turned on to them, and and how, and what was your what age and what was your reaction when you started uh, this, when you first get, like what what was the first Robin Williams movie you saw? Let's start there. I would think it was Popeye. Oh, really? I, yeah, because I watched a ton of cartoons, and so I knew mm-hmm. I knew of it, and I and I knew of him. I probably didn't see it till closer to nineteen ninety or something like that, right? Because um, I wasn't even alive when it was out, but you know. I, th- I think that was the first one, and obviously the crossover because it mm-hmm. it is a cartoon. Because um, I certainly wasn't looking up for Robert Altman movies, going right, right. which one am I going to check out next? Right, right. <laughs> so then, when you saw Garp, hmm, the player or Popeye? <laughs> <laughs> when you saw the Worldling according to Garp, how old were you, and what was your reaction to it? That's one I still haven't seen. Really? Yeah. For a long time in my life, I had a hard time getting that straight with what's eating Gilbert Grape, because they're long. <laughs> they start with W, Grape, Garp. I, I don't know. It just, I lost it somewhere in the... What's eating Gilbert Garp? Yeah, I just <laughs> never got a hold of that one. Well, here's what I recommend. Um, read the novel first, then watch the film, and that'll take you about four to six weeks. <laughs> yeah, the movie, again, it was a, one of these films I saw when I was a kid, probably one of the movies I... Sh- no, I did not see it as a kid. Yeah, I don't probably. think I was allowed to see it as a kid. Oh, my parents took me to a bunch of yeah. stuff I shouldn't have been watching. Um, and I was like completely blown away by it because I it, there's so many heavy moments in that movie. So what year was that? And that was 1982. 82, yeah. There were so many heavy, heavy moments in that movie and then hilarious moments And as a kid, I was so mesmerized by the fact, well, there's funny Garp, or there's funny Mork, you know. So you were 13? Yeah. And I was like... I can imagine not everything resonated with you in that film. It was so weird. Some did, though. Yeah. You know, I was learning about sex and violence way too young. (laughs) So... so, um, So it inappropriately resonated yes, with you. It, yeah, and there was a per- the, mo- the worst time at the wrong moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're just entering into adolescence. You're it. learning about all this weird sexual <laughs> shit and all this stuff that happens in that film. So it's great. It doesn't make that time even more confusing at no, all. No, not mm. at all, because there's, uh, there's no discussions of deviant sexual behavior not in that at movie all. at all. Not at all. There are any weird sex acts that happened in that movie. Um, <laughs> And then uh, as you uh, move, I think I had just moved from Madison, Wisconsin to, uh, to Chicago. That wasn't difficult to deal with at all. So then this movie just really just ironed it all out. It really <laughs> made that time brilliant. I think I just, then I got braces. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Gawky body, braces, acne. And then, then you met John Lithgow and then, asked him why he wasn't in a dress. Yeah. John Lithgow was a yeah transsexual <laughs> football player woman thing. So that was great. Yeah, this movie was awesome. <laughs> um, see i saw movies like when i was three i saw and i distinctly remember seeing uh friday the 13th part three or four or something like that the first for three year old great Perfect. jaws great also so inappropriate like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i'm like afraid of the water and the woods at the same time so luckily I lived, well you should yeah be. luckily i lived in cities so it wasn't mm. um, did you see Candyman? <laughs> no <laughs> i still haven't seen Candyman. <laughs> So then, it's on the list. It would you give know. you nowhere to live after uh, <laughs> if you saw that at three. <laughs> so uh, then you had, well, like The Survivors, which, you know, is a weird uh, Walter Matha movie. It was yeah. one of those films where you're just like, how did this? Yeah, they, it was like, that was like that Tom Hanks. Stripes, is, uh, or? That was like when Tom Hanks was doing stuff like Neighbors. Man with One Red Shoe. Yeah. And Tom yeah. Hanks didn't do Neighbors. That was... Um, you're thinking of John Belushi. Oh, John Belushi, right, right. Yeah, but that was the Tom Hanks the Man with One Red Shoe and all those like volunteers and yeah, yeah volunteers and stripes. And yeah, the Burbs. That's the, the one. Burbs. Yeah, the yeah. Burbs. Um, so, so then you had, but then of course, I, I, again, another movie that um, I absolutely loved was uh, Moscow on the Hudson. Yeah, that movie's great. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Which. Um, you know, again, I was uh, 14 or something at the time and got to see Maria Conchito Alonso's boobs in it. And mm-hmm. that was wonderful. As these, and, and What's th- wrong with sex? Sex is good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was another movie that, um, you know, he's a, it's height of the Cold War. Mm-hmm. So he defects. Yeah, he's a circus performer. He's a circus performer. Or a musician. He's a musician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and 
and what it's like being, especially that's Manhattan in the eighties, right? Which was very sort of you know Snake Plissken up for grabs. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that that film, what, what did you think of that when you saw that, Aaron? I mean, it's it's amazing. He, I mean, he learned to speak Russian for just the the commitment as an actor. He he learned to speak Russian and play the saxophone for that role. Like he's not. They're not dicking around dubbing it in later. I mean, he's he did it all, you know, and he's not just doing improv gibberish, right? Russian, you know, he's and speaking those are, actual language. Those aren't two easy things, Russian. No. Yeah, no, I yeah, they tried to teach me Russian at one point, and it was like, what is what are these Legos? These are not <laughs> letters; these are Legos. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was with Paul Mazursky. God, you look at the, the, the directors he's worked with. You know, like he's worked with some some pretty. Uh, pretty amazing yeah and he said that the the guy they hired to teach him russian um he said this on his inside the actor's studio that the guy who taught him russian was also an acting uh professor in russia or something like that so he said he credited him with really you know getting him right both um, in the language and in the role right um and then you know he had this the best of times and club paradise um seize the day uh, but then he did um, Good Morning Vietnam, which, uh, as you were talking about, well, first of all, he did uh, a TV movie. He did the voice on uh, this, which is a really good TV movie documentary, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam, which is a great book mm -hmm. that somebody collected letters from Vietnam soldiers that they had written home to their families and all of the things they're talking about. God, I don't even remember this. This, this was a TV, a TV movie? Uh, it was a documentary that I think was... Uh, yeah, it was a TV movie. Um, they basically just hired um, actors to read... The letters. To read the letters. Yeah, kind of like Ken Burns did with yeah. Civil War. Got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they hired people like William Defoe and Tom Berenger and people who'd been in Vietnam films. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know Kevin Dillon and 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 so Gary Busey yeah. is he in it? Maybe. No. Um, <laughs> I think you mean Gary Sinise. Yeah. Brian Dennehy's in it. Um, so so it, uh, the reason I bring this up is because I read that book and I read the actual letters and it's 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 really powerful mm. because first of all it's a different era in terms of there was no Skype or. Right. Yeah. Soldiers couldn't call home or anything like that. They had to write letters in their tent or whatever, and and under fire, under fire, or between in the foxhole. Yeah, mm -hmm. like this awful thing happened today, and there's pools of blood in the mud, and 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 they're sending that back to their their brother or whatever. And so um, it's a really it's a book I should suggest reading and or watch this documentary. But then you had. Um, Good Morning Vietnam, which is just the more we talk about this, the more it's fascinating because, again, Good Morning Vietnam, I mean, they kind of build it as a comedy, mm -hmm. zany, you know, good yeah. morning Vietnam, right? And, and, um, anything with the word v Vietnam in the title, you should kind of know <laughs> yeah. that should don't, this shouldn't be marketed as a comedy, right? Yeah. It's, it's, um, but the thing about Good Morning Vietnam that I thought was amazing, again, Barry Levinson, another, you know, um, big name director. It's Forrest Whitaker, a young Forrest Whitaker's in it. And uh, Bruno Kirby oh, yeah. is great as just, he plays a great tool. <laughs> um, you've got all these great, you've got Robert Wool in it. And then J.T. Walsh, who's just uh, a complete asshole. And um, it's... Uh, <laughs> Richard Edson, uh, who else is it? There's all these... There's, Richard Edson was in Platoon. Yeah, yeah. he was in both. Yeah. Um, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, all yeah. the same year. I think. Yeah, I know. That was, his, like, that was his like character actor, you know, Grand Slam. Yeah. Um, but Good Morning Vietnam was one of those things where everybody talked about how he just improvised the radio scenes. They just, Barry Levinson just put a camera on him and said be a morning DJ and this actual guy that he was depicting when the movie came out was like, I, I didn't come close <laughs> yeah, to I wish I was that good. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and again, then it has these, so many of his movies kind of tricked you into, ha ha, Robin Williams. And then there's these heavy moments in that yeah. film because he's in a war zone, you know, and he befriends that kid. 
Mm-hmm. Saves his life. Saves mm-hmm. his life, and and the way the kid talks about you know Robin's like you know you were we were supposed to be friends, and he's like friends. What are you talking about? You GIs come in here, and you're the enemy. Yeah, you blow everything up, and you knock up these girls, and then split, and I'm supposed to be your friend, you know? Um, which was uh, which was good stuff. Resonant. Resonant. Um, but is it is it not I mean do you not agree that it's the perfect kind of role for a stand up like you kind of you go up you perform well for the right stand up Yeah well certainly I mean yeah. Robin obviously is the perfect guy for it but I'm just saying in terms of like you walk up to this weird place you do your performance then you walk out into the horror of the rest of the world and maybe you've hopefully you've brightened a few days Oh right, you're talking about just you mean being a DJ, like a radio DJ or? in a war zone like oh, that. Right. Yeah, I mean, well, it, it was one of those things where that scene, you know, resonated with me later. Obviously, when I started going overseas, where he's like, oh, "Fuck this, I'm tired of the bureaucracy," and they're stuck. And Forrest Whitaker, and he's talking. He's like, "I'm quitting." And Forrest Whitaker looks around and goes, "Hey guys, look who I've got with me," and he forces. You know Robin Williams' character to perform basically yeah. for these guys, and he sees his value and his and the importance of it. And um, I remember that scene like sort of popping into my memory as I like the first time I went over mm-hmm. there and was like, "What? What am I doing? Like this is terrifying. This is stupid. I don't feel like." And numerous times on those trips, I remember when. Um, uh, I went over there once with uh, with Scott Kennedy, um, who passed away like a little over a year ago. And, and Scott Kennedy was a comic who we've mentioned on the show before. He went over there like 50 sometimes. And we um, were getting ready to fly to do um, – we're going to get to go to some – Base. We, we had three shows a day. Scott always had us going to like three or four shows a day on all, mm-hmm. all small fire bases. And we're on the the flight line, which is basically the, the landing deck for helicopters. And we're waiting for our ride and it's early in the morning. And uh, all of a sudden he gets some calls him over and he gets a call and he said, this, this base we were supposed to go to got into a firefight last night and two guys died. So we're not going. The show's – and I remember sitting on there going – and I was sitting there going, God, I feel so stupid. I was like, I feel like, who cares? I was like, who cares? What would flying around telling jokes? I felt so dumb and useless. And like, you know, these, these guys on this base are going through something awful. The family's just got the worst news. And, um, and I've been on aircraft where we picked up Flag Brave Coffin, so I knew like what was going to happen next. And I said this is kind of like, I just feel like such a fucking asshole. And he goes, Graham, I'm coming here every month, four or five months from now. I will go back to these bases and make sure they get a show. He goes, I had a commanding officer tell me that every time a comedy show comes through town, suicide rate drops, comes through the base. The suicide rate on the base drops. He goes, so we're saving lives and we're going to find other shows to do today. And I was like... He just kind of knocked me back, no, said, you know, yeah, set yeah. me straight. Set and I was straight, just like, yeah. was, this is your job. This is mm-hmm. your mission. Let's go. And this is why it is important. This is why useful. it is so important. And it's what I lived out that actual scene, that that was what that scene in Good Morning Vietnam was. I had that actually happen to mm-hmm. me. And so it going back, it makes that movie, for me at least, more, more poignant. Mm-hmm. Um, and on then, a on a lighter note, do you do you not get that with uh, with podcast fans too, where where you're walking around kind of anonymously, then they hear your voice, you, you're talking to a barista or something, and then they go, Graham Elwood. <laughs> <laughs> I feel well, like I have that all the time. Uh, town. Well, I don't I don't get recognized that much for, but you know what, I I do get it from um, coming up after shows or. Or the emails we get, or in Japan, or in Japan, or like well, you know, we did these when we did all these interviews for the documentary for earbuds. But one of the reasons why we wanted to do the documentary was we got the emails, and 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 uh, there's been plenty of days where Chris or myself were like, oh, 
this isn't making any money and what the fuck are we doing? And we yeah. get some email about, hey, your podcast helped me get through this. Yeah. And we go... Or it inspired me to do this. Right, right. Or yeah, tough time, parent passed away or something like that. And then, then you go, oh, and it really, it does really bring that back. Because especially this even more so than stand-up, we're literally just in a garage. Like, mm-hmm. is anyone right. listening to this? <laughs> you know, and you forget that when you put it out there on the internet, yeah, uh, thousands of people do hear it. So mm-hmm. that that is a... That is a weird thing. So, um, and then we've got, uh, then after that he does some other, what well, does Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Now he wasn't a lead in that, uh, no. Adventures of Baron Munchausen. He was um, the man in the moon. Mm-hmm. And, but it's, again, it's a great cameo. Um, the thing that I loved about it too is it kind of set up um, his relationship with Terry Gilliam um, for when they did the Fisher King together. Yeah. Which, jumping forward, again, great movie. Yeah, funny Robin Williams, but this dark, super heavy, dark, heavy, heavy social, social yeah. commentary. Mm-hmm. I mean, how he became homeless yeah. Yeah. at a restaurant and his wife got gunned down, like, <laughs> and he yeah. lost his shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty. Uh, it's it's pretty heavy stuff. The other thing I I love it about the collaboration is Terry Gilliam and Robin Williams have a lot in common. In that they um, they put on the surface goofy, funny characters, but underneath there is a lot of dark shit going on. Yeah. Like even if you look at a movie like Brazil, where there's a lot of laugh out loud funny moments, but mm-hmm. underneath it's terrifyingly <laughs> morbid and dark. Uh, yeah, here's a you know, the mo- here's your fucked up future. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah isn't it hilarious? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm like, oh, wait, no, this is terrifying, mm-hmm. and it might actually yeah. happen. And here with Comic Relief, Robert yeah. De Niro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When Robert De Niro's playing Comic Relief in a movie, you know that movie's dark. Uh, <laughs> That's what he's known for, yeah. guys. Yeah, um, So you look at uh, when Cape they... Cape Fear. Yeah. <laughs> when they get together, you see that Robin Williams and Terry Gilliam had such a kindred spirit. You could see on the collaboration, just how much they were so in sync. And I honestly, it's not one of his more well-known movies, but Fisher King is probably one of my favorites. It's great. Yeah. I just watched it this morning. What did you think of it watching it again? Cause it came out in 91. I, I feel like I saw it probably too young. I was probably like 11. And I just, I vividly remember seeing the scenes of his wife dying and, and his breakdown as, uh, um, in relation to that. And I mean, it was just his, I, just as heavy as I remember, or more, you know. Now that I'm the age where that sort of crazy thing could happen, you know. Right. I mean, whew. especially when you think about it, you had two good. And Jeff Bridges' character lo- loses his shit. You know, yeah. he's a shock jock, and then he kind of causes the mass shooting. Causes the or has a hand in it at least. You know, I mean, he yeah, kind yeah. of incites these. He, he kind of eggs on the guy who does it. You know? Right. Um, and then. When he meets um, Robin Williams and how he sort of has this transformation, but then you so, also sort of see who he really is, you know, and it is sort of, Fisher King has some heavy indictments about corporate media and corporate America, yeah. you know, and, and, and the... Tied in with the themes of religion, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how willingness we are to sell out. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff yeah. Bridges yeah. is so willing to just sell out, you know, and... Um, but I want to get back to uh, between uh, Fisher King. Um, well, there was Dead Poet Society came out in '89, and then we had Cadillac Man Awakenings, which is interesting. Dead Again yeah. shakes the clown. But I think that was what was interesting when I looked back at IMDb was uh, at his career was he almost went comedy drama, comedy drama. I mean, as early as Garp. Yeah, you almost feel like he's doing that that classic one for them, one for me. Yeah. Like, you know, I get to do Dead Poet Society. Okay, I'll make Cadillac Man. Dead Again is one movie that, again, is just a cameo. Yeah. And um, it's, again, not a great movie. Yeah. But his cameo is so interesting. Um, really just, it's that kind of thing. Well, wait, I kind of want to see more of this character. But you never do. It's just a short yeah. it's a kind of thing with Kenneth Branagh threw in. But I want to get back to... Um, Dead Poets Society because then that was another this is another huge one for his career because he it was a huge one and everyone I knew 
saw that movie. It yeah. was one of those movies that literally uh, everyone talked about, everyone saw, and it, it was not, oh, you didn't see Dead Poets? Like, then there's something wrong with you if you hadn't <laughs> gone to see that movie. Well, because I think it, uh, you know, I was just getting out of high school and going into college, and, you know, I didn't, I went to public school, I didn't go to, like, rich kid prep schools, but still there was that pressure mm-hmm. of... Got to get good grades. Got to go to a good college. If you don't go to a good college, you're screwed. That you know? would have been great if that was actually the name of the school. Wait. Rich Kid Prep School. Rich Kid Prep School. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <clears throat> I remember. Oh, I didn't get into Rich Kid Prep School. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All mm-hmm. right. Got to go to middle class. <laughs> <You gotta> go. <laughs> <laughs> middle class university. Yeah. Um, Their mascot is the whining crowns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the trust funders. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, but I remember though why that that movie resonated with me was I, Evanston, the suburb I grew up in, is on the North Shore of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Which just watch a John Hughes movie and that'll give you an idea of what what it was like. Yeah. But there was all these Loyola's right there. Loyola, right? you've got Loyola University. You've also got Loyola Academy, but you've got Evanston, Wilmette, Winnetka, Glencoe. These are Evanston is is uh, integrated. It's been integrated for like over a hundred years, but the rest of them are very white and very wealthy. And I remember like dating a girl that went to a private Catholic school and going to one of her winter formals and all these all these rich kids and everything. But then I remember that they did have that that they had a dad and a mom who were like, "You're going to this school." Like I remember a girl told me. She wasn't allowed to apply to colleges west of the Mississippi because her parents were like, there's no good schools out there. <laughs> you're not, and they were like, a lot of them were like, you're not going to school in California because that's, you're going to go lose your shit out there. Yeah. Like you had to go to an Ivy League school. And if you didn't. Mm, no one's going to college and coming out hippie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you're not going to think for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing a lot of kids like that. And so when this movie came out, I was like, it made total sense. And it also launched all these, you know, Robert Sean Leonard, Ethan Hawke, Josh Charles, like mm-hmm. all these. That was a huge cast. Yeah. Huge. And it's like Diner. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> yeah, they were all really young. And then yeah. Norman Lloyd is in it, who um, I remember from St. Elsewhere. And uh, it's, it's one of those movies that the message is in it. I'll ne- I'll never forget that when he did that scene where he's like, look at all these guys before. And he goes, they're all dead. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, better go seize the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and and um, it was directed by Peter Weir, who has also directed, he directed... Uh, the did he way- do 2010? Yeah, he did Truman. Um, he did The Way Back. He did a bunch of interesting stuff. Yeah, the Mosquito Coast. Did um, he do that with I, Harrison Ford? Yeah. Let me, let's check here. Peter Weir did Mosquito Coast. Um, You're living dangerously. Mosquito Coast. Dead yeah. Poet Society. Green Card. Truman Show. Um, it's a weird movie, Mosquito Coast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't have a happy ending. You know? It's a, it's a, it's just, it is a, it's like, you're just not sure what you're watching right. when yeah. you're watching that movie. Yeah. It, it is a little bizarre. Um, but then let me get back to, uh, um, after, uh, after, yeah, and then of course between Dead Poets and Fisher King is only, it's only a two year period, but then you have all these insane movies that we talked about. Um, but even though I remember Awakenings, like I, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Because um, again, these are like movies I was watching in college, and Awakenings was, you know, based on a true story. Um, I guess uh, the the Oliver Sacks book, um, and it was one of those films where you're just like, this isn't wacky Robin Williams. Yeah. No. It's, it's not Patch Adams. No. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 wow, it's heartbreaking mm-hmm. to see uh, you know Rob, him deal with Robert De Niro's character, who's you know catatonic to kind of waking up, and then 
the one guy in, at the in the end. Spoiler alert. <laughs> we probably should have said that at some point. Yeah, we're going to spoil some of these. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for for him to be the one who ends up back in that state too is it's heartbreaking. And it's an amazing performance by Robert De Niro. Yeah, to play all those states of catatonic and various forms between catatonic and completely lucid and back again. Yeah, um, w- was pretty fascinating. Um, and it was one of those movies I remember watching it just going Jesus. And I think like kind of going back to why this Robin Williams death has affected me and, and, and so many of us so much is because he was able to personally connect on so many different movies and so many different roles. Yes. Like you said, like he, and he also did fucking Patch Adams, which is yeah. why was that movie made? You know what I mean? Like you know, you know, you, you brought up a really good point, and I think one of the reasons too we resonate so much with Robin Williams is nowadays there's a stigma if actors kind of go from adult movies to comedies to kids movies. And there, first of all, there's very few actors that can do it yeah. at all. Um, but you know, when you look at like Just the Vin rock Diesel. and yeah, yeah. Or like, <laughs> the only one. yeah. Yeah. And you look yeah. at, and you're like, and they do it poorly. Yeah. But when you look at someone like Robin Williams, he can do everything from Aladdin to Jumanji to the Fisher King to dead poet society. And you never feel once like, Oh, he's just, doing this for a paycheck or he's he's not he's phoning it in he and it's something that you can and even popeye too like you know he didn't not a good movie but did he phone it in no no, no not he at all was popeye yeah so yeah, he's 100 percent. you look committed. at you look at an actor in a career like that you realize that oh we kind of grew up with him too right. because yeah. and then we introduced our kids to him because of aladdin and all the and jumanji and this is you know the, our first um, introduction for our children to Robin Williams, and I mean, then when they're older, we'll show them the. Well, uh, you just the hit the nail ones. on the head. Yeah. Like why it's affecting uh, mainly people in our age group is we did grow up with him. Yes, you know, like we did watch him as a kid on whatever, whatever you're, whether you're in your 30s or 40s, you watch him as a kid in something, yeah. right? And you did then. Oh, that's his voice in this animated thing. And then right. you, as you got older, you watched him do these very intense things like Awakenings and right. the, and, and had this, this heavy subject matter like the Fisher King. And, 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 and you go, uh, they're, they're just, um, they're kind of stunning like that he was able to do that because then he has been a part of of your life yes uh, on on numerous numerous ways i I felt that way um when i was in college like when i was in my 20s when jim henson died and i felt that was like a very personally affecting death of someone i had never met but had affected my life and and me too i mean i was only eight when it happened and but you know, you grow up with the Muppets. And, right. The, the, yeah. on, the, on, the only eight years that you had been alive had been with him. He, yeah. He had right. grossly the Muppets, impacted your Sesame life. Sesame Street, and then yeah, exactly. I'm, eight, I'm right in the age range for Ninja Turtles and mm-hmm. every every part of it. Oh. And then uh, um, then when you look at that with Robin Williams now, with, when we're older, you realize, oh no, when I was that age, I was also watching Robin Williams, but and I never stopped watching him up until his death. Really, in fact, we'll. We'll probably keep watching him because there's still movies he's been in that haven't been released yet. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I know there's at least a, a, another night at the museum movie, and then I think there's a couple more too. Yeah. And there's still a few scattered in there, you know, in the mid '90s, some independents that we didn't. You know, oh sure. Probably mm-hmm. didn't check out. And um, and then you've got like we said Aladdin and toys, but even again, like I was, I loved toys when it came out. I'm sure oh, if did I you? watched it now, I would be like, what? Oh, uh, we all hated it even you, yeah. as when it came out. I, we thought it was awful. I just was so mesmerized by all great of colors. It. Yeah, <laughs> Robin Wright and then LL Cool J, and I don't know. Um, Disguised as the pillows, that was pretty funny. <laughs> when he would come yeah, out of yeah, the wall yeah. or whatever, <laughs> like that scene stuck out to me. And then Mrs. Doubtfire, which. I did a a Benson interruption of it a couple months back. Man, that movie has a lot of really ridiculous shit in there that makes zero sense. But going to Robin's acting, it it is amazing what he does. Yeah, it, it he is this old Irish woman. You know, obviously there's a lot of makeup and prosthetics, but it, that was what was so spectacular about it. It's like Mike Myers playing Shrek. Right. It's like he literally. It's the character. It would be like though if Mike Myers was a live action Shrek, yeah. right? Right. You know, and and 
which there's a live action Shrek on Netflix. It's the the stage musical. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if if Mike Myers had done it, it'd be great. But yeah. Um, because again, and then what else did he do? And then he did Being Human. Um, nine months. Uh, nine months is his role as the the obstetrician in that one. I mean, that's it's amazing. It's weird, and it's he's Russian again, and. <laughs> I don't remember that movie. Yeah, it, was he in it a lot? Uh, yeah, well, any any time the pregnant lady Julianne Moore goes to the doctor, so yeah, oh. it's quite a, quite a bit. And the the delivery scene is hilarious. My my family and I would watch that movie all the time just because that delivery scene is so hilarious. They're driving on the streets of San Francisco. They like hit a bicyclist and they <laughs> get in the car. We're going to the hospital anyway. They stop short of a old couple and. He starts having a heart attack. Get in the car. They drop them all off at once. You know, it's, yeah, and then and then him in there is, in, as the doctor is so so hilarious. Um, so let's go back here. Um, he takes a hold of that movie the way that like we, you know we all thought Quicksilver did in the in the la- last X Men. You know, it's like that scene is amazing, mm-hmm. and yet it's only this one little little piece of it well that's kind of his things if you if you look at his imdb page there are all these little parts that he has in a lot of um a lot of bigger films and but he would do that though you know Mm -hmm. he had that ability of even if he was just in it a a small scene it was a scene that you remembered oh that was a robin williams scene yeah um and then uh jumanji which again is one of these really sort of Invented fi- inventive films. I mean, it's crazy, mm-hmm. and there's some there's some cliche stuff in there that isn't great, kind of like Hook or whatever. But I don't know. A lot of people love Hook. I, we, yeah, that was another one well, growing I will, up. I yeah. will say, my kids loved Hook, but yeah. I remember seeing it as a kid. I didn't like it either, and it was the first time we'd ever saw in a review the word overproduced <laughs> in a review <laughs> yeah, when that, when it came out. Yeah, it was like big, giant, lavish sets and costumes, and then a story that was just like. Meh. You know, and uh, but when you look back at uh, you loved Hook, though, right, Aaron? I his, think his is any one of my generation. Yes. yes, you know, you know who also everyone from that generation when Doug and I would make fun of that movie on Doug Loves Movies would get mad. Yeah. Oh, really? In okay. late twenties, early thirties, they always like, no, Hook's great. Wow. Like they hold- yeah. <laughs> I mean, we probably haven't seen it since we were nine. <laughs> no. I will say, you know what really holds up is Dustin Hoffman's performance. Yeah, it's hysterical. Yeah, it's Hook, yeah. Still. Yeah, and and Hoskins is. It's me. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny you bring up Dustin Hoffman because he's like one of the only uh, handful of other people who whatever character he's playing, you can't picture him in, in anything else. Right. Uh, that's what Robin Williams did, mm-hmm. you know, like, and you go through Dustin Hoffman's career. I mean, obviously, it's more dramatic. That's who he is. But, yeah. but uh, he has those parts where you're like, I can't picture him as anybody other than Ratso Rizzo. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. I just can't picture him anyway. And then you can't picture him anybody other than like the guy in Rain Man. Yeah. You know. Um, but uh, so why did Hook? Why did you and your generation like Hook so much? Do you think, Aaron? I think. I mean, it was obviously bright and colorful, which all kids love. And there's sword fighting, mm-hmm. and we all we all know the story of Peter Pan um, because we'd all probably watch the the animated version of yes. it at mm-hmm. that point. So. I think to take it to the next step of what else would happen, and I mean, you can look at that cast too. They're just they're all really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, be- besides Hoffman, Hoskins, and I think it's Gwyneth Paltrow's first movie. Mm-hmm. Julia Roberts. Is Julia Roberts mm-hmm. is Tinkerbell. I mean, it's it's loaded. And then I don't know if we have. I mean, I know Jim Carrey's kind of been on a similar career track, at least trying to do drama and comedy, but. Has any actor acted with children as well as Robin Williams? No, and acted as a child essentially, as in an adult body with with children. I mean, Hook. You've got Jack, which isn't great, but it's still, mm-hmm. it's who yeah. else could you see in that role? You know, you know? I, I, it's interesting you bring that up. I've talked to a development executive who worked in children's programming, and he said to me, "Children." They don't like watching other children. Like when you have shows about other children and stuff, what they like is to watch adults act like children. So you can see how 
um, broad Robin Williams' appeal was. Mm-hmm. And I really think there's some truth to that. Mm-hmm. As I as I look back on like the successful family and shows and movies and stuff, I'm like, were they always about kids? I'm like, no, they were, you know, about adults kind of acting childish or the right. ones that mm-hmm. tended to or resonate a lot. Or yeah, whatever. or silly, yeah, yeah. Like the roles like you're talking about. Well, I want to talk about Two Goodwill Hunting, which came out in 1997, because that, again, like... That movie came out of nowhere, too. It came out of nowhere, and he's not really funny in it at all. He's he's funny. He, he's not being Robin Williams funny. He's being a good actor who's playing... Mm-hmm. This is how an Irish guy that grew up in Boston, who's a college professor, would, would be. And who has a fair amount of mileage on him. Yeah. Like there's certain, he, he, the thing I loved about it is that he has a worn, weathered look and mannerism about him that is not easy to do mm-hmm. for an actor. And you could tell he was tapping into some <laughs> real sadness. Well, on he's his, not, at home. he's also not a pretty boy. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and so he, he looks like a guy. He looks exactly like a guy that would be in that spot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. And with it, you know, with some shit that happened to him in the past. I mean, and the way they subtly handled some of the stuff, like he was in Vietnam. You know, there's the same Matt Damon just goes, you still counsel vets, you know, or whatever. And then his wife dies of cancer. And, and I mean, this movie was like, it came out of nowhere. Somebody, first of all, nobody knew who Matt Damon and Ben Affleck were. Yeah. And you're like, who the fuck is this kid? And then Robin Williams is playing this very quiet, I mean, it's a very intimate film because it mm. l- largely takes place in a therapist's office. Yeah. yeah. And you it's know, a small cast, too. It's a small cast, Mini Driver we'd never heard of before. Mm-hmm. Um, and even um, Skarsgård, uh, Stellan Skarsgård, had we seen him in much prior to that? Not in the U.S. Not no. in the U.S. And he shows up as and plays perfectly this pompous math genius. Um and all these guys, I mean, really never heard of Ben Affleck. We hadn't heard of Cole Hauser or Casey Affleck. Mm-hmm. And they're all like... Oh, ben Affleck was slowly emerging. Yeah. Sure. I knew him from Voyage of the Mimi. Yeah. <laughs> and wasn't this tel- also... Educational program. Wasn't this also from Clerks 2, after Clerks 2? It, sure. No, no. Clerks 2 is like 2006. Yeah. Or 2004. Oh, okay. um, it would have been right before Dogma, which they were both in together. Right. Which I think is part of. It. I think Kevin Smith was a EP on. Uh, what about Chasing Amy? Chasing, he had done Chasing okay, Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Done yeah. Done yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, you know he had done. He done Phantoms. I oh, know. I was thinking of Mall Rats. That's but right. Phantoms came out after Goodwill Hunting. Oh, was it? Well, um, yeah. But again, Goodwill Hunting was, was, was this movie that 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 launched all these people, mm-hmm. and it's one of those like it's so great. I mean, it's it's. You know, Matt Damon, what he's dealing with. And, I mean, first that montage of therapists that he that he has to go to for the court order, which was great. Bill Plimpton was, like, awesome, mm-hmm. you know. And then when he... The conversations, too, like... I, I love the arguments between Stellan Skarsgård and Robin Williams when they're arguing what to do with them because they both are coming from the right... They're both coming from an, a genuine place. Like, mm-hmm. one guy isn't obviously the bad guy. Yeah, He's just like, no, you've got to work hard. And then... Robin was like, no, if you push him too hard. And the, the arguments that they have, the way they were... Sometimes in movies, they'll have these arguments where one person talks and then the other person talks. And it's mm. like, not a lot of arguments go that way. Usually people are talking <laughs> over each other. And yeah. and he did that very Only well. Only on the screen. And um, and then the relationship with Minnie, Minnie Driver and... and and, the, and then those scenes, I mean, like so many of those, that scene with Ben Affleck where they're, where they're doing construction and he's like, and Matt Damon's like, yeah, you know, grow my kids up here. And, we're, and Ben Affleck goes, what the fuck no, are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, you got a gift. Get you got here. a winning lottery ticket. Yeah. He goes, if you're still here, I'm going to kill you myself. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to be 50. And that's fine. You know, and it's just like, I remember having a conversation as not that's but with my buddy in high school and i was whatever and he just said what do you you gotta go man yeah you, you gotta, gotta host get, strip poker you gotta do you gotta <laughs> game shows and sell t-shirts out of a gargoyle garage yeah. <laughs> like you have to do it you've got a future you've got, 
you got to tell jokes in shitty <laughs> bars because that's your only way of making money because you have no marketable skills. Yeah. Like you have to go out and do this. You're actually you are, terrible at construction. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have a movie ruined in Bulgaria. <laughs> You have to do a half a dozen pilots that never get picked up. <laughs> um, but yeah, like that whole scene and that, you know, there's heavy abuse stuff in there and, and, and all that. And mm-hmm. I remember seeing that, I seen that Did movie. Did Stanley Kubrick snap, smack somebody in this yeah, movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just showed up on set. <laughs> yeah. Said, I'm like the foster dad. Um, yeah, and it was like uh, one of those things where you, you just – couldn't believe it. It's, it's, it's one of those movies that when you're flipping through the channels and it's on, you stop, mm-hmm. right? And you yeah. watch it. Um, Did it send you guys through a like a down a Gus Van Sant like chasing the dragon to try and find a good movie that he's done since then? Like, no, I feel like it's been. I really didn't rough. want that challenge. Yeah, <laughs> I tried. I mean, it was like drugstore cowboy, and Did he do the Psycho remake too. And he did the Psycho yeah, remake, yeah. and then he I did thought it. Elephant was going to be great. And, no. It's one of those things where you're just like, come on, Gus. Come on, get it. How do you make a school shooting not interesting to watch? Right. Uh, yeah. How? <laughs> uh, it's, he's one of those, I don't know. I don't know if he was a guy like lost his touch or what. But um, So we'll skip forward a little. Uh, we went Can through, we not? Because I watched What Dreams May Come last night. Really? Oh, wow. That, I was worried because I knew that was going to be heart-wrenching because that's all about a guy dying. Yeah, it sure is. Suicide and... I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was a kick in the chest. And, you know, I, I was counting how many times I broke down and cried. And it was four, mm-hmm. which is a lot. It broke up's record. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing. And, and obviously, visually, it's, it is. Visually, amazing. especially at the yeah. time, it was like groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah. I, I was saying I to my girlfriend, I think they could do this easier now. Mm-hmm. But oh, yeah, pull it off. Easier. I never saw it. Oh, because the subject matter at the time was like a little hard. Yeah, it's wait, definitely wait hard. a year, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> it's rough with. with it's him. not uh, when I I remember watching it, being absolutely blown away by the visuals. Like these were amazing. Like I think it was also the time I remember seeing like this is when the um, to get into the video game aspect of it, like the CD ROM adventures were really becoming mm-hmm. uh, popular, and and that type of detail in a world that was being created, and that's. Uh, I think that tapped into a little bit when we I was yeah. watching that movie because these fantastic colorful worlds were being created. Um so it's I can't imagine watching that movie now that made a good point Aaron. I think I might wait before I watch that one again uh because of the subject matters but you know well then we haven't even talked about World's Greatest Dad yet which is yeah, yeah. yeah it's but uh where are we now on the list? Well, we are coming see the, that was um that was late nineties, so we're coming up. What uh, yeah. dreams may come? Then you had Patch Adams, which we talked about. Right. Then you had Jacob the Liar. Then you had Bicentennial Man, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we Marcus we Chris Columbus. We skipped uh, Father's Day, and that's that's okay. Yeah, it was Father's <laughs> Day. Billy Crystal. I remember that one. Flubber. <laughs> Not good. Deconstructing Harry. Um, His one Woody Allen film. Yeah. Then you have. Then we get into two thousands. Then we all of a sudden, <laughs> again, he does this insane one hour photo, death to Smoochie and insomnia. Yeah. Right. And one hour photo and insomnia are. I really like both of yeah. them. Yeah. Did really you really? Tense. I did. See, I thought one hour photo was awful. I really didn't like one hour photo. Now insomnia. It's a I hard did, ride. I, like, I mean, it's it's. It didn't tension. resonate with me. It was. I thought. I thought even Robin Williams. I thought he was. He did the best he could for what the material was giving mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. I thought it, it was a very contrived kind of character and story that they were trying to do. Like, look, here's like you know, here's the psychopath as he's slowly deteriorating and yeah. you know harassing this family. And like, yeah. I never really bought it. But you know, is, Insomnia is another story. I, a, I thought it is a music video director. So yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Photo. And it just it didn't it didn't resonate with me. Insomnia I thought was uh, was much better. Yeah, and I saw someone write about right Insomnia. Like Christopher Nolan, yeah. yeah, our hero. It was right um, after uh, I think it was his Memento. movie after Memento. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we pre Dark Knight. Someone wrote on Facebook like Robin Williams stood head toe to toe with Pacino and De Niro better than they stood head to head against each other. Oh yeah, in Heat or. Later on, uh, uh, terrible movie. Won't even mention. Yeah, uh, the, the, if you look at who he's acted across and who's directed him, 
like there's no other comedian that's done that. Yeah. You know, there's a, and there's a handful of actors. I mean, there's really like the, the it's, it's maybe 10 names or something like that you could come yeah. up with if you start putting these people against. Um, and I think because he would then do something like Death to Smoochie, maybe. Now, Death to Smoochie, I liked. Yeah, it's really it's a wacky. Yeah. It was wacky. one of those I movies mean, it's a that Danny DeVito film. <laughs> like it's it weird. Was, it was one of those movies <laughs> that I really was expecting to not like, yeah. and I thought, well, this is you know got terrible reviews. Yeah, it yeah. it didn't do well, and it, I I found it to have this weird kind of quirky charm to it, mm -hmm. especially with Ed Norton, Ed Norton acting yeah. like, you know, this um, forgiving every man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like, you've had to watch a lot of children's programming. Yes, so. and I've had to watch a lot of children's <laughs> programming. So. so to see the behind the scenes of that, <laughs> John Stewart's in it, yeah. Um, Can so I talk about the time I met Robin Williams? Yes. Because mm -hmm. that was around that time. Uh, I would have brought you a sample of his arm hair, but at the time he didn't have any because he'd done one hour photo and shaved it all off. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but, but yeah, I didn't notice was, that. <laughs> yeah, but it was 2002 and he was going back to stand up for, I mean, possibly 20 years, the first time in 20 mm -hmm. years, do his live on Broadway. And I was just a lowly concert security guard in San Diego uh, in college, just, you know, doing, right. doing a part time job. And, you know, one day I called in for work and they're like, hey, you want to do this gig? You're going to guard Robin Williams' dressing room. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let me, yeah, <laughs> get me in on that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Where? What? How? Okay. So I get down there and I'm, you know, kind of hanging out by myself. I meet his tour manager and then his wife and then at the time his wife. Um, then he comes up and we kind of cordially say hello, but my hands are so sweaty because I'm like, Mm -hmm. This is Robin Williams already. I already know who he is at this point. He's already an Oscar winner. He's already right. a hero. Like yeah. I like I said in my email to you guys, pitching myself to be on this episode, and I pitched hard. <laughs> um, it worked. Well, you, yeah, yeah, you convinced us. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, I'd seen his stand-up special at the Roxy mm -hmm. just a million times. So this guy was a legend to me at, at, in only 2002. Mm -hmm. um, and just to, to meet him and... and uh, to see him interact with the crew of the, you know, the stage crew, the lighting guy, the sound guys. I mean, he put on his own show for them, which was amazing, you know, because he could have just gone back and hid in his dressing room and been that guy. And nobody would fault him for it. He's, you know, he's got to prepare for a show, do his thing. But mm -hmm. he he lit them up. And then and then uh, later on, he came back out real quiet. And that's what I tell people when I tell them about meeting him is when I met him, I saw both both ends of the spectrum. I saw the high and I saw the quiet mm -hmm. and it's interesting that how quiet he could be. And he just kind of slunked around the room and looked at things on the wall. Cause this is a, a big performing arts right. venue in San Diego. So he's looking at all the cast photos and then he, he kind of sits down on the stairs above them and, and looks to me and just says, Hey, so is this your main gig? And me knowing, knowing I was going to have this job had prepared like, I'm going to be... Uh, Did you, you know, pull out notes? I should have. I really should have. <laughs> well, if I was less socially awkward, it would have gone much better. Because <laughs> I was prepared. I was like, I'm a film major at San Diego State. Like, I'm. what do you got for me? You know, I didn't have any idea whether that would be offensive or whatever to him. I thought he might, he might hiss at me or something and right. make a crucifix with his hands. That's what I expected. And then he says that. He says that sentence in that way, and I was just like completely baffled by it and i was just like uh i mean i work at the convention center too and uh and then we work at concerts and i think i used the phrase uh that's my bread and butter uh <laughs> which i don't i don't know how old i was at 19 but that's your bread and butter at 19 that was my brother, yeah wearing a security work, shirt and yeah a, did you tell him he should get on the trolley <laughs> A yellow get off my get security. off my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we were in suit and tie, sir. Oh, I mean, this wow. was excuse me. This was big shit. Excuse me. Um, yeah, and he just kind of went ah, like I mean, it was clear I missed what I was. I missed my cue, <laughs> Mister Mister Demille. Uh, <laughs> so you were back to one. Yeah, back to one. Um, I mean, the one thing that was cool is that he came down. And he looked at this photo of Hello Dolly, the the production that had been there, and. You know, he was—he gave me a Carol Channing impression, which I felt pretty proud of. No way. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so that was nice. But yeah, then, then he kind of, he did a show actually, interestingly enough, I, I almost forgot the, um, the one moment we really shared that was super, super funny. And I, I tried to be professional the whole night and that's why I was an idiot. Um, the sound guy is going to mic him up. He's going to put a lavalier on him. He's got to strap it to his chest because Robin sweats like a, you right. know, like a gorilla. With, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the analogy. Uh, Something that's with horror, a gorilla whore in church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the guy's strapping this thing to his chest and he's like, Robin, can you pull your shirt up? So he pulls his shirt up with two fingers. Uh, just imagine your hands to your sides and your elbows tucked in. He pulls it up like this. And just looks at me like a kid whose mom has, you know, got a Kleenex with right. spit on it and dabbing off his face. And he looks at me and I just fell down laughing. It was so ridiculous because he's, you know, this legend and he just has this little kid face on him. <laughs> and maybe that's what was so relatable about him is you right. know, that, that face he could always make. <laughs> you know. um, well, cool, man. Uh, there, the, the la- there was one of the man of the year, of course, came out in 2006, which is another like a, a comedian – becomes president which was again great social commentary lewis black is in it right uh, and um you know very very fitting so you know guys um if any of you haven't heard any of these movies we talked about today go watch them go check them out and i do want to mention um world's greatest dad you guys have to see this movie it's probably one of my favorite robin williams movies it's going to be unbelievably difficult to watch again because his yeah. son commits suicide in the movie. His son is a complete dickwad. Yeah, yeah. And he kills himself. <laughs> but he kills himself. Um, so it's a really difficult movie to watch, but it's one of those movies that you shows how funny and how um, poignant and sad Robin Williams could be all in the same film. Yeah. And that quote that's been going around Facebook, you know, about how it's better to be alone than to be in a group of people who make you feel alone that's that's from that movie it's uh i assume mm-hmm. bobcat wrote that though i don't probably don't know why it's being attributed to robin but yeah i was at a, i was at a um a birthday party for murray valeriano who's been on this podcast Yay. and was talking to road stories yeah i also used to intern for road stories oh right on <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and road stories we just added to la Podfest this year uh and I was talking to a, a buddy of mine and him and his, his girlfriend, we were talking about it and she was, has a chronic illness and she goes, he had <laughs> depression, drug addiction, and then found mm. out he had Parkinson's. She goes, mm. and I'm not saying this is any sort of answer or insight, but it, it made sense to me. She goes, I, she, she has very, a, a chronic uh, like bone thing that's very painful. And she goes, if I found out I had to then deal with cancer or something else, she goes, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to keep going. Yeah, and he also had a heart condition too. He had a valve replaced at some point. So. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so I don't know. It, it, I, I understand. So yeah. check out these movies, and also just on a um, on a note, we were talking about it before. You know, if you are depressed and you're feeling really horrible, you know, call somebody, get help. Yeah. You, re- mm-hmm. it's available, it's out there. And the the good news, if I can give you any, is that. Uh, Mental illness is becoming more and more understood because uh, this country, we're starting from ground zero with mental, literally, w- with um, with mental illness. We just don't know enough about it, and we're not educated enough about it. So call somebody, talk to somebody, help is available. Mm-hmm. And I know you said somebody had reached out to you after this happened too, Graham, which is, which is great. I mean, I think we're going in the right direction with raising awareness with mental illness. Yeah, because it's this whole, yeah, the whole... There's he less had stigma. Everything. Why would he? That, yeah, that, 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 it's that, starting to go away, which yeah. is good. Good because it's like he had everything. Why would he get cancer? Right. You know, yeah. if you start looking at like an il- an ailment, an illness, not a choice. Yeah. You know, and so before, uh, oh, certain, you're rich. Why did you get the flu? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are certain comedians or people in the media who are pointing at the medications too, and I think that's irresponsible. Like we don't know. Yeah, we we don't know, and those are those same medications are helping. How many people? You, you know? don't. We don't know. Yeah. yeah, they're helping. They're helping people, and whatever they were misprescribed. You don't know that. Yeah. we don't know that. It's, it's. It's. I think. I think. Chris, you make the point of like, we're just really starting to f- even be ready to try to understand this. Yeah. yeah, and I think we just need to all approach it like that. Like, let's just get as much information as we can because we don't have enough. We really, we we. 
you know, we don't have enough information. The medical community and science is, is trying to figure stuff out and who knows. So, yeah, if, if you're going through a tough thing, reach out. Reach out to somebody, call a professional, you know, just Google help for that. You yeah, know, it yeah. might be support groups in your area or even just call, like, again, call a friend. A friend called me and we talked and it was it was. I'm glad she called me. I'm Good. glad I was able to do something about it. So thank you guys so much. Um, this was a great episode. We really uh, enjoyed doing it, and we hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we um, did. So uh, we want to thank our guest, Aaron. Uh, let's see if we can get it right. Brungart. 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 No heart. No heart. No, no heart in Brungart. <laughs> Brungart. It's Brungart. <laughs> the Germans have no heart. Hearts up this week. Um, so, Aaron, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Hilarinous. That's H-I-L-A-A-R-O-N. <laughs> of course. Hilarinous. Yes. Sure. A German way for it to say hilarious. Um, a nope. confusing way. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, if you guys listen to any of the other All Things Comedy shows... Um, Aaron has helped. Well, you work on the show. You've helped out over there with the last Yeah, time. absolutely. And you're going to be at LA Pot Fest. Of course. So, come. unfortunately, I have a wedding to go to on the Saturday. So I will be there Friday and Sunday. Who's wedding? A friend in Arizona. Oh, come on. I know. Just Skype it. Terrible. In. Terrible uh, timing. Terrible timing. Tell them to postpone it. Um, Pod <laughs> Fest wedding. Oh, <laughs> we'll perform the ceremony. Um, so yeah, come meet Aaron live at LA Podfest, yeah. September 26th through the 28th. Get your tickets at LAPodfest.com. Thank you once again, Aaron. Um, Thank you. My name, oh, let's see. Dream what? come true. Dream come true? Right oh, on, dude. Glad we could, uh, <laughs> we could make one dream come true. <laughs> We're able to do one once a year. We yeah. Can, this was my make-a-wish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's not even dying. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all are. Well, yeah. <laughs> invariably. Um, so I'll be headlining the Improv in Hollywood, California, September 13th. And oh, that'll be a fun show. That'll be a fun show. Uh, Chris is going to be on it, and we're going to add some other folks. So stay tuned to that. Use coupon code GRAM if you go to the improv.com website. Use coupon code GRAM. Get two tickets for 10 bucks, And then I will be uh, headlining the Zanies in Rosemont, Illinois, um, right out there at that financial bank thing with all the restaurants and whatnot. Uh, September 17th through 20. And I believe if you wear a Palm Strike shirt on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, or you will be arrested. You will, you will be handcuffed and maced in the face for dressing like an asshole. So be ready. Um, yeah, so uh, you, you get uh, discount tickets and uh, also coupon code uh, Elwood, I believe, gets you $5 tickets on any of the off. Obviously, Saturday, you got to pay, pay full boat, but. Come on the off nights, get some discounts. And then and Stanley Kubrick will slap you. He'll yeah. slap you right in your yappy mouth. Yeah. Elwood will be hard to remember in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not big on that word at all. There's not two guys still dressed up like that right now. Uh, all right, thank you once again, Aaron Bungart. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Let's see, Brungart. 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 No, mm -hmm. I think we say it better. Brungard. Brungart. Just Aaron. It's like a fist. Yeah. Brungart. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't mispronounce. I have to at least That's mispronounce true. one name mm -hmm. a show. So That's true. Congratulations, Aaron. <laughs> um, <laughs> have we done a bad accent? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I'm from San Diego. I don't know. Yeah. Um, that's how they speak in San Diego. It is. I Let's was end this goddamn episode. Thank you, Aaron. My name is Graham Elwood. I'm Chris Mancini, and as always, remember Han, Han shot, shot first. first.